All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks um, thanks again for being here. We're gonna get started uh, right away here. Allison Scobber, Consolidated Planning Group. We are a holistic special needs financial planning firm. Uh, we put out webinars on a pretty regular basis on special needs um, planning topics, uh, various topics, but today, um, we are super excited to have Marilyn Gilbreth uh, with us, and she is going to be talking <clears throat> about the very important topic and that is confusing to many on um, vocational rehab. So, so today's session is being recorded. Um, you will get an email with the recording either later today or tomorrow. Um, we ask that you put your um, questions in the chat box. You are muted. Your cameras are muted. Um, your, your mics are muted. And if you have questions, we want your questions. So please put those in the chat box. And we're going to get to just as many uh, questions as we can today. So um, having said that, I would just like to turn that straight over to you, Marilyn. Thanks for being with us again. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you all? Um, my name is Marilyn Gilbreth, and I am the Community Outreach and Awareness Specialist. Uh, and we call ourselves SACOA. And so I'm going to talk to you today about vocational rehabilitation services and what we do as an agency. Next slide, please. So the first thing that people generally talk about is this, what is vocational rehabilitation? So let me say this, vocational rehabilitation, and you hear me refer to it as VR services, help people with disabilities uh, obtain, retain, or advance in competitive integrated employment. And for some of you, it may be uh, before we can obtain the employment, you may need to have assistance with your student getting pre prepared for uh, employment. So we help people with a disability prepare for, obtain, retain, or advance in competitive integrated employment. And people say, well, what does that mean? Competitive integrated employment is a job you or I would do, okay? Who do we serve? So Texas Workforce Solutions VR Services serves people with a variety of disabilities. And so people go, well, what kind? There is no disability we don't serve. And I wanna make sure we're very clear with that. Uh, we work with people with blindness and visual impairments, including legally blind, people with a hearing impairment, uh, people with mental or behavioral health conditions, uh, physical disabilities, such as birth defects, cerebral palsy, back injuries. Uh, traumatic brain injuries, seizures, epilepsy, uh, those with intellectual and developmental disabilities, other physical and mental conditions that impact a person's ability to go to work. So we serve any and every disability there is. If somebody has a disability and a desire to go to work, we can, we can work with them to help them to that end. Next slide. So, People talk about, well, how am I going to be eligible for services? And so I talked about preparing for, uh, talked about obtaining, uh, retaining, advancing. So you're eligible for services depending on how your disability interferes with work. So let me be clear. Everybody who has a disability doesn't need our services. And I'm sure we all know somebody that we worked with before or we know in the community who has a disability and they're perfectly fine. However, there are those groups of people whose disability interferes with them getting a job. So you're eligible first if your disability interferes with you getting a job, okay? Next slide. Um, Marilyn, before we move on, um, sure. will you just go ahead and give us some examples of that? Like for instance, if somebody's ADHD or autism spectrum disorder, some some examples that you have seen over and over again where it, it is you know, kind of an impairment to employment. Can you talk about so that? So a good one is, is bipolar. So somebody with bipolar disorder, you know, they take their meds for a while and they're great. And then they think I'm doing great. I don't need to take them anymore. They stop taking their medication and they decompensate. And so we help somebody with, with bipolar dis, uh, disorder understand what that looks like and what that's about. It's not going away. You may be medicated for a time period and you can function, but it's not something where you can take them, you can stop taking the medication and, and be fine with it. We teach people how to understand their disability, how to care for the disability long term. Okay. Another so, one so might be like some of the social ineptness that may come with autism or some of the impulsive um, utterances that might come out of an ADHD um, brain, 
are some of those things like you guys do some like coaching and are like, you know, help with, um, help with closing the gap on some of those, um, shortcomings. So we have things for like personal social adjustment training, work adjustment training. We have those kind of programs. We have summer programs called SEAL, Summer Earn and Learn, where we teach kids how to, how to, uh, how to work by giving them a job that it's okay for them to, to not do well on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's practicing work. So we have different activities like that for transition age students who, uh, one of the things I tell people all the time, uh, especially when I was a transition uh, program specialist, at 16, if you have ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder and something else going on, and you get up, you get on a job, and the second week you don't like what the uh, manager said to you or did to you, and you curse the manager. Okay, well then you get fired. Then you come back to us, and we sit down and have a conversation. What are some better ways we could have worked through that process, Allison? What other things could we have done versus cussing, you know, cursing out the manager? Here's some skill sets we want to teach you so that you don't do that the next time. Then the next summer they get a job. Maybe they work the whole summer before the manager ticks them off and they curse the manager out. Have we seen progress? Yes, we have, okay? So we're teaching coping skills and mechanisms and other things that you can do to put in place of that. Okay, does that answer that, Allison? Yes, yes, Thank you, sure. I appreciate that. And so the first requirement for eligibility is that the customer has a physical or mental disability that results in a barrier. So all of our VR services are going to be tailored to that barrier. Okay, so you sit down with your counselor and you start talking about this is what my disability is. This is how I function. These are the things that get in the way of work. These are the things that get in the way of preparing for work, which may be vocational training, academic training, resume writing, whatever that thing is that's preparing. Here are the things that get in the way of that. So vocational services, our federal dollars, provide vendors, uh, companies, people, to teach or train or assist that person in reducing or eliminating those barriers. That's the first requirement. Second requirement for eligibility. Next slide. Is the impairment must cause a substantial impediment to employment. So here's what this means. If you have ADHD and you've worked 30 years with ADHD, and you're one of those people that got laid off, uh, not because of COVID, but you got laid off because the company went out of business or something happened, whatever. And you come to our agency and say, hey, you know, I, I need help finding a job. We need to know that your impairment is a substantial impediment to employment. How is that, how is your ADHD going to keep you from getting the next job? Because you worked 30 years. So we have to talk about those kind of circumstances. Because yes, it's a, it's a significant disability, but what is the impediment to employment? Okay, third requirement, next slide, is that the customer requires VR services, requires VR services. So we're not, um, we're not a, I'll pick that thing, I'll pick that thing, and I want that thing, but I don't want this thing. So when we start talking about your, your disability and what the impediments are, we sit down and talk about services to address the, all the impediments. We can't pick and choose. Well, you know, I want you to help me with that area of my disability, but I'm okay with that other area. We have to look at the entire disability and how it is an impediment to you getting a job. So the third requirement is that your disability requires VR services and you're willing to participate in the VR services. That's remember, the big are, one. That's, that's the, big, the one. big one. So, so we hear the, this all the time where we have parents, so the parents want their kids to go to work. And the kid doesn't want to go to work. <laughs> so, so talk about that, Marilyn. Yes, Allison. I just had that this morning. Uh, I've, I've done about, let's see, six presentations. And what is it, 12.15? Today alone. <laughs> uh, and so uh, and go back. Don't, don't skip to that slide just yet. But one of the things, I had a parent this morning, and I completely understood her concerns. Um, she's calling about her son who has a disability. Her son's at school. And so I said, how old is your son? She said, 17. How many 17 year old boys do you know that you can just tell them what to do and they're gonna do it? 
And guess what? The counselor is not calling Allison. The counselor is going to call the 17 year old young man. Allison can be on the call, but the VR services are for the 17 year old young person. And if that young person is not interested in VR services, then we're not being a good steward over taxpayer dollars. So I always encourage parents, please don't call me and, and have me do an initial contact on your child and the child's not there, okay? Because we all say what our kids are going to do. And that doesn't always ring true. And because we're using BRI federal dollars, we need to make sure that the student's on board. And here's, here's the thing, because as I said, I was a transition specialist and I know there are some catchphrases that just throw teenagers off the bus. You know, we're not going to sit down and say, hi, Allison, my name is Marilyn. Tell me what your disability is. That's, that's, that's turning everybody off, adults as well as transition age youth. We sit down and talk to students about, tell me what accommodations you get in the classroom. Tell me about the things that you like. What are your subjects you enjoy? What are your subjects that you don't enjoy? And tell me what that looks like in terms of when you go to an art. What do they say in art about you? What are they talking about? Are you engaged in your own art? Do you get to speak up about what's going on? Tell me what you wanna do after high school. Tell me what things you think are going to get in the way of that. That's the conversation we have as a council with this transition student because they have to buy into it. All of us as adults, we want the very best for our kids but we have to let them buy into it as well. I can't tell you how many times as a transition VR counselor, because I've been a TVRC too, working with the kids in the school, I put a kid through what I just talked about, through Goodwill, personal social adjustment training and work adjustment training, which is teaching them how to get to work on time, how to take a break on time, how to come back from the break on time, how to go to lunch timely, how to stay off your phone while you're working, appropriate conversations on the job, inappropriate conversations, all of that. And I've had parents call me and say, "Miss Gilbreth, can you please tell Johnny to get up out of bed and go to training? Mom, dad, if you can't get him up out of bed to go to training, I certainly can. And so if, he's, if he or she is not going to participate in the VR program, that's, that's, that's probably what we need to stop. We need to first get that person to buy in. Sometimes students get it, sometimes they don't. It's hard to watch your child go through something that you know you could save them from. But sometimes trying to get a 15 year old to engage in the VR process is probably not appropriate. Maybe they need a little bit longer. Or we have programs, we have a new program now called Potentially Eligible, okay? So it's kind of like coming in and testing VR services. So maybe they don't want to completely uh, sign up for vocational rehabilitation services because that's nothing wrong with me. Um, but they may participate in some type of activity we have under potentially eligible where they can do a particular program that summer or whatever time frame they have and they can get an idea of what it looks like. Okay, but we absolutely, absolutely have to have um, the students buy in to participate. So that fourth requirement is that the customer could benefit from the services and they can become employable after our VR services. That's that fourth requirement, okay? The so basically ages 14 to 22. Um, it's so, transition. So, um, and I know, and we, this is basically about the VR right now, um, but are there additional programs for, um, for folks that have kids that are above age 22 that maybe didn't know this program existed when their kids were younger? That's our adult program. They're adults. Okay. They are an adult. And so they just come through the system as an adult. Okay. So they graduated definitely... high school, they, then they come through the program as an adult. The awesome. transition program is while they're still in school or aging out. But the moment okay. they graduate high school or age out, they're in the adult program. And, and the way to make that make sense to parents sometimes, because it, it, it's kind of hard to delineate, is that as a transition VR counselor, pre-COVID, that counselor was in the school every week at that, school, that child's school, working with the teachers and the SPED coordinators and the 504 coordinators and whomever is in that child's world on the school setting. When they graduate high school, that TBRC is still assigned to that high school. The student can't come back to the high school to meet with the counselor because you've graduated, okay? So they go to an adult caseload at that point. 
Okay. And, and so, <clears throat> um, also in the example, so we talk about kids being in school, public school, private school, homeschool, et cetera. Um, but what if they're already in college? What if they're above, they're 18 or above? I know you said 14 to 22 and they're already in college. Um, can you still help them that way too? Anybody with a physical, mental, a visual disability. Perfect. Doesn't matter what their station is, what they're doing. It's if they have, because you're in college to get a job. You're going to college because you you've already identified a vocational goal. And so you're in college with that goal in mind. And if, if you're in college and you're struggling, you're already going to be connected to the uh, uh, Office of Students with Disabilities. And so that's going to be your help right there. Because if you're connected to the Office of Students with Disabilities, you're automatically going to be connected to us because that office is going to do that. All colleges have students with disability services. And in order to get their services, you probably have come through us or a private VR program. So eligibility for VRC, does it depend on your income? I love this one, okay? Eligibility has nothing to do with your income, okay? Nothing to do with your income, okay? So I want to make sure people understand that. Now, if you're talking about going to college, then yes, we want you to fill out the FAFSA. Yes, there'll be some family contributions as well as our agency. But eligibility, it does not factor into um, depending on income. So what well, kind of service? I want, I, I want you to clarify that because I think sometimes people don't understand that. And I know you're getting ready to go into some of these services. But I think understanding that that your program is state and federally funded and that you guys have got lots of money and that you have to spend it um, and the kinds of things that you guys are spending it on, it's important for us to, to know that. That's something that I learned and that I thought was pretty awesome. So if you'll convey that, I appreciate it. And that's right here because here's some of the services we pay for. They're right here. We pay for training. That can be vocational training. That's uh, barber school, CNA training. Uh, want to be a firefighter, I need a two-year certificate, um, counseling, not VR counseling, but somebody, let's say someone's schizophrenic, they need one-on-one -on -one counseling, okay, so we can pay for, we can pay for one-on-one -on -one counseling services to get them connected to somebody, we can pay for medical services, so somebody's having a surgery, uh, somebody's an amputee, okay, hearing aids, transportation, Vehicle modifications fall under that. So you got somebody who's a wheelchair user, okay? And the only way for them to get to work is that they have to drive to work. So they, get, they have to modify their vehicle. Prosthetics, we pay for sign language interpreters. We pay for braille instruction. We pay for orientation and mobility. What is orientation and mobility? Somebody who has a visual impairment needs to learn how to get from home to their new job site and how to navigate the job site and how to get from their job site back home. That's orientation and mobility. On the job supports, that's job coaching, that's supported employment. If somebody's more severe, that's supported employment, that those are on the job supports. And help finding employment, building your resume, helping you learn how to interview, interview skills, dressing appropriately. You know, all those things come into that. And those just a few, a very small portion of the services we provide. Whatever the impediments to employment for that person is, we need to determine VR services to address those. So that's why it's a, it's a, there's no number you can attach to it because it depends on what the impediment or what, what's getting in the way. Then we need to determine what VR services can address that particular need. Does that make sense? So, so basically you're customizing. So for each of um, our kids that might be eligible for this program, um, once they come into this process, you're customizing and tailoring a program um, to them based off of the assessments that you guys have done and the results of those assessments that have determined what, what the gaps are or what the issues are. Is as well the as the medical or documentation the parents have on the students before we even got to them. Because gotcha. that's, that's good foundational information. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's individualized services, okay? So you may not need all the services and there may be other services that you need. So that's not an exhaustive list, but it, you're right, Allison, it's an individualized 
uh, DR program of services because what one per what one person who has bipolar needs to reach their employment goal, another person with bipolar disorder may need something entirely different. And so two people with bipolar may function entirely different in terms of what their impediments to employment are. Okay, somebody newly diagnosed with, with bipolar has a different set of skill sets going on because they don't even understand what's happening to them. Somebody who's been had bipolar for 10, 12 years, they get it, they just don't wanna get it. At this point, they're trying to work through some things. I feel great on my meds. I don't wanna take them anymore. That's a different kind of conversation, okay? Next slide. So what is the plan? It's an individualized plan for employment. So the student, the adult says, this is my vocational goal. Here's how my disability is getting in the way of me reaching that goal. And the VRI counselor and the student or the adult sits down and says, here are the services, the VR services I need to reduce or eliminate the things getting in the way of me getting to that employment goal. That makes sense? So we have to have an employment goal. So some people say, well, you know, kids don't know what they want to be. Exactly. That's why we have things like summer earn and learn, uh, paid work experience, uh, internships. Let them try different things out, you know, so they can see what they like and they can come up with an idea. So then we're in that individualized plan for employment. It is a partnership between the student and the counselor. And so parents say, well, where's, where's my piece in that? Your piece in that is, is a support person. Your piece in that is a support person. Because um, a student may say, you know, I want to be, uh, I, I love the new commercial that comes on TV now about the military. And so the, the, the child is talking to a parent in terms of being in that job already. And the parent saying, well, why do you really want to do that? So they're showing the, 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 the uh, spill on the commercial where the student is saying, this is why I want to do this. I want to help people. So the vocational goal that the student has may not necessarily be the same vocational goal that the parent has, but who are we working with? We're working with the student, okay? And so we have to go with the vocational goal that, that they are wanting. Now, is every vocational goal that the student comes with appropriate? No, it's not. And so that's a part where we have to sit down and, and help that student understand. Um, here, here are um, your skill sets. Here are the things that that particular job requires. Let's figure out, can you attain those things, okay? And, and an example I like to use that kind of brings that home is that sometimes a student, um, you know, we have different levels of IDD. So sometimes a student who has IDD, they may be reading at a, at a seventh or eighth grade level. It's gonna be difficult, didn't say impossible, it's gonna be difficult for us to write a vocational goal right now that says you're going to be a physician. Does that make sense? So we have to look at those things. Right now, this is your disability. This is your skill set. In order to be a physician, here's all the things you've got to do. How, how are we going to bridge that gap? That's the conversation we're having. And one thing, Marilyn, that I would like to highlight is, again, you know, your services start from 14 to 22. And, and some people's diagnosis, their maturity level is is much younger than what their actual age is and, and we see that but based off of what you're saying to me that's the reason why getting started earlier is good um, because you can kind of build up where they are at 14 versus 18 and this program doesn't last forever but kind of moving them in that direction they're growing they're maturing they're learning along the way. And so what the outlook may look like when they're 14 versus actually ready to, to find competitive employment at age 16 are two different things. And so having that two year or a year and a half or a year ramp up period to that, I think is beneficial. I, it absolutely is. And, and you know, I've been around for a little over 30 years. And so there was a time frame where we didn't start working with, with high school kids into their senior year. And that was really way too late. And then they, they dial the needle back and they said, okay, we recognize that that's not working. We're going to start working with kids at 16. That didn't work either. And I'm, I'm so happy to say that my organization has really uh, moved the needle and we're starting at 14 because typically what, what I get calls from that 14-year-old kid is typically in middle school. 
And so I get a lot of calls from the, 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 the parent at the middle school or the, or the counselor saying, this kid's newly diagnosed with uh, uh, amputa amputation. That's a difficult thing for an adult. It's certainly difficult for a 14 year old. Or this 14 year old has been diagnosed with schizophrenia. Mom and dad don't have it, but they kind of remember one of the grandparents had it. We don't know what to do. How can we help? You know, it's important to start helping a 14 year old understand their mental health diagnosis than to let them go through stuff and spiral and try and fail and then get to the end at 21 or 22 or 30 and they're coming to us. So I'm very proud of my agency for, for dialing the, 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 the needle back and starting with age 14. Because then we have all that time while they're in school to work with them and provide VR services to help them get to the point where they can do competitive integrated employment. Well, I think it's important to note on these assessments, and you already said it's individualized, it's up on the screen. Um, so the assessments that are done are individualized to that, that, that person. It may or may not include neuropsych testing. So if your kid is going on to college or a program, that testing needs to be updated within the last three years, typically for the Office of Disability. So this may be something that in, in, instead of you covering the tab of that, VR in, uh, ends up um, covering some of these. Some of, there's a ton of assessments. Basically what I'm saying is that as a parent, you could private pay for this out of pocket with the same agencies that VR contracts with, and you're going to get the same, uh, basically the same results, only you private pay for it, or it could, it could be, and I'm not saying it is because it's a good, again, you know, to that tailored plan, but these are thousands of dollars of testing that, that end up happening, uh, that, it doesn't end up being out of pocket expense for a family. And I think that that's important to understand because we need these results to be able to help guide our kids in the right direction. And, and whatever that test might be, some people have underlying mental illness or you know maybe they need a psych eval and there's, there's other underlying diagnoses that haven't been diagnosed. It could be anything, but can you just talk about that, Marilyn? Sure, because with mental health uh, diagnoses, Typically, if, if a kid is on meds for their mental health uh, concerns, the nurse, they have to go to the nurse to get it. They can't, they can't carry the meds around with them and take them at will. So they have to go to the nurse. So the school's already privy to that. So there's something in the records already that you've had to provide to the school or the school has done the testing because you just can't walk into the nurse's office and take a psychotropic drug and not have some paperwork behind it. So it can be private pay, as you said, Allison, or the school ha could have already done the testing and they've determined there's a need, okay? So the school's test, I think it's every three years. So when you're going to your ARDS or your 504s, you're asking those questions and making sure you have the most current information. Now with our agency, we pull the school records. That's one of the things that we ask for. It's when we were determining eligibility, we're asking for the school's records, whatever they have. If your child is on uh, medication uh, and has, is, is doing one-on-one -on -one counseling, and, and this is a very good point, Allison, thank you, because this just came up not too long ago. A, a student with um, a mental health disorder is seeing a counselor, has been seeing uh, a psychiatrist for like seven or eight years, and the parents don't wanna release the information. That doesn't help us. So we're, we're the person trying to help that student. You've got some medical documentation that can help us make sure that whatever job we put that student in is a good fit, but you're unwilling to share that, that slice of the information. Am I making sense, Allison? That's really not a good fit. Um, if you're trying to be that private, you, you're really doing the student a disservice. And if, and, and, and I'm, gonna, I'm gonna step out on a limb here and say this, and I mean it in the most respectful way. If you feel there's something in those documents that if, if made public to a VR entity or to an employer would not make them employable, it's coming out. It's going to come out. It's going to come out on a job or it's going to come out in the preparation and neither one of those situations are good. 
So there's no reason to hide that kind of in information. We deal with people who have some severe disabilities. We do, there's nothing we haven't seen, okay? So keeping that information from us just doesn't allow us to do a good job fit. So to be clear, um, we had a we had a question. So like, um, you know, the beginning you said that there has to be a documented disability. And so the question is, is can that come from the school records and or medical professionals or one or the other? Are you looking for both? We want both because because there are some things that the school will have that that I promise you, if, if, if it's difficult for them to give us the psychiatrist records, the school doesn't have them because the school doesn't even ask for that. They just need the letter from the doctor saying this child needs meds so many times a day, et cetera. We need the actual records. So it's both, if it's that kind of situation. And so that's a conversation I really want parents to sit down and have with their counselor, because we need to ask what is, what's in these medical records that you feel is detrimental to your child getting employment? Because we need to address that. Does that make sense, Allison? Oops. Yes, for sure. Okay. And so then once we go, go back again, once we get through that individualized plan for employment, uh, it's a, that successful closure. Uh, Allison said it earlier. It's one more after this. Uh, sorry, the next one. Okay. Keep going. One more. There you go. So Allison said it earlier, our service is not lifetime. They're not. That's why we want to get in, sit down, assess what the, the disability is, what are the impediments, what are the things that are getting in the way, and let's do an individualized plan for employment so that we can get you to your employment goal. Once you get to your employment goal, your counselor has to verify your employment. People get a little uh, uh, up in arms about this. We don't have to call Allison and say, Allison, does Marilyn work for you? I know she's got a mental health disability. Okay, that's not what we do. Okay, Allison has an HR department. People call all the time and verify employment. All the time, you're buying a car, you're buying a house, you're getting a credit card. So that's a norm. So our counselors have a process of verifying employment. Once they verify employment, your, your case is successfully closed after you've been on that job. 90 consecutive days without any issues. We close your case to successful. So then I hear people say, well, what happens if they work that job a year and they don't like it anymore and they want to find another job? There's no impediment to employment because hopefully the skills we taught you before will help you go and look for another job. Now, if you worked on that job a couple of years and your disability got you fired, that's an altogether different conversation and you need to call us, okay? And I see a couple of chat, I see three chats. So Allison, I'll let you read it because I can't see what they say. I just see the number. We've already addressed those. So we'll just keep okay. going. Any other questions for me, guys? I, I, I say this all the time. We are the best kept secret. Call me if you have questions. I, uh, I wanna give you a phone number. Uh, you can call our rapid engagement team. So it's 512-936-6400. Or you can call the VR office locator. That will connect you to the office closest to you. So yes, we're in COVID situations, but you can still find out what office is closest to you so that you can determine which person your child or your, your uh, the adult is going to be working with. Or you can call me and I can do an initial contact with you and your child or with you if you're needing services and get you connected to a counselor, okay? So we're pretty excited about the fact that in spite of COVID, we're still helping people go to work. Um, our TVRCs are not necessarily out in the schools right now, but I think that's coming back this summer. Um, so if, you're, if your child attends a school and they have a TVRC or a BRC assigned to the school, the person to ask about that is your special ed coordinator your 504 coordinator, in some situations, it may be your sister principal. Do we have a VR um, representative coming to our campus or assigned to our campus? That, and that can get you um, your, your foot in the door pretty quick or contact me. 
And let me give me my phone number too. I don't think I have it on this one. It's 281. Can you put that in the chat for me, Allison? 732-1316. You can reach me at 281-732-1316. Um, yes, I've definitely put that in the chat. And um, some things that I like to address, I like to talk about because, um, because we're working with special needs families every day. We hear different stories along the way. Um, I haven't been able to connect with VR. I haven't, um, or we connected and then we never got a call back or things like that. So I am excited to say that's why Marilyn is here. Um, she's here for a reason. They recognize that there was an issue with this program. There was a high turnover rate of employees. There were people that weren't calling back. COVID made everything worse, um, but, but they are committed and they're on this. So if you had a bad experience in the past, pick up the pieces and come back to the table is my suggestion. I've personally gone down this highway with, with my own kids. The, the, the experience has been good. And I mean, and it is a process. You, there is documentation and other things that you have to get in and you have to be organized to, to kind of get this set up. Um, but I think that the, the, the short-term and long-term benefits to our kids are huge. And, um, you know, we, we want to find out now if they're going to continue to get fired over and over and over again, or if they can't, you know, sustain or things like that. that. I mean, sooner versus yeah. later is good for us to know this. Yeah. Let me say this too. Getting fired from a job for us as adults is just horrific. And we've heard all the sad stories in, in the news about people losing their jobs and what they do. It's not a bad thing for kids. It's a learning experience. It's an absolute learning experience because every time they're fired from a job and, and they're connected to VR, we're sitting down discussing what went wrong and how do we rectify that so we do better in the next situation. And I know people laugh when I talk about that cursing thing, but that's absolutely true. I, I, I taught that when I was a transition specialist. It's okay. It really is okay to curse out your boss at 16. It's not okay to do that at 26. So we need to, to give you some skill sets to teach you how to navigate that world. We have all had bosses that make us angry. We learn over time how to handle those situations. And that's part of what VR does, is teaching kids a skill set on how you handle this, situ this situation. How do, you add, how do you start a job and be two weeks in and need to tell the boss, I want to be off a month so I can go to Italy with my family. Okay? It's cause and effect. Let's talk about what that's going to look like. Let's talk about what the worst case scenario is and what the best case scenario is. And that's part of what VR services are. For sure. This is, I mean, this is so good. And I, I, I know that we've had you several times, but it's never enough because this is a <laughs> lot of information to, um, to take in. So we're definitely... Uh, definitely, there's your contact information slide so you guys can screenshot Excellent. that. And again, you guys are going to get uh, um, an email with this with this video. But um, yeah, this is such important stuff. And like I said, I think it's um, it's so good. Like just even the assessments and the things that we've kind of been going through the the process with. We're kind of new to the process with with my own kids. Um, but it's good. It's good information and we're learning a lot and we're turning the knobs on it. Is it time consuming as a parent? Yes. Um, but, but what's more time consuming your kid that never, ever, ever goes to work and lives with you forever and ever and ever, <laughs> you know, I, you know, I don't know. Like, so there is a, an element of time that goes into this, but it's so super important. And the deposits that the kids are getting of these positive experiences and, and earning some money and being a needed or important and actually having a job. I think that those are all, all, um, all really good things. So um, we are um, ending early today. And these are just a few things that should be on your special needs planning radar. Um, we have a YouTube channel that basically has recordings on every single one of these topics. One thing that I want to pull out of the list today is what about VR and going to work and SSI and Medicaid? And that is a whole presentation in itself. But the bottom line is, is so if your child works, does their SSI get reduced? And the answer is yes. OK, now there can be a, uh, a credit. OK, uh, an earned income credit if they're a full time student between the ages of 18 to 22, basically going to school full time or there's some part-time hours that are allowed for an individual with disabilities. 
but th so the question is, is do I want this? If it's going to mess up their SSI, if it's going to reduce their SSI check, do, do I want this? And the answer is yes, because th the, the SSI is only $7.94 a month or five something a month if, if you don't have a housing agreement in place or whatever. But but what we're wanting to do is see if they can work. And obviously, $7.94 a month is not enough to sustain them. So if in the meantime, we're trying to figure this out and they're not full-time students and their SSI is going to be reduced, what if they make $1,100 that month? That's definitely more than $7.94. So um, we're uh, SSI uh, and SSDI specialists. Um, we're, we're certified in that, so we can talk more about that. But that is a question that we get all the time, so we can talk about those things. And so anyway, these are just things that should be on your radar. If you've got a child that's transitioning, there's a lot of um, a lot of moving parts as it um, as it relates to maintaining eligibility for future benefits for your kids. And so these are just some of those. Um, and if you want to reach out to us directly, um, we're happy to um, talk to you about your unique situation and kind of where you are in the planning process and what you need help with. Sometimes people need help with developing a future care plan. There's anywhere along the way where you might be, we're happy to help. So this is um, definitely how you can reach us. Um, so I'm just going to go back to Marilyn's contact information. Marilyn, I would really like to say thank you again for being with us. And of course, we're going to have you back. And um, you always provide such great information. So uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank you guys so much for having me. Everybody be safe out there. Absolutely. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.